Okay, so we're continuing these lectures on solid shape. <clears throat> uh, we talked last time about the idea that we're that for both curves and surfaces, we're um, talking about fitted frames. And the motion of that frame, as you, in the case of a curve, move along the curve, or in the case of a surface, as you move in some direction on that, in the tangent plane of that surface. Uh, and as you do that, the frame, all it can do is rotate. Besides that infinitesimal trans translation, which we're not talking about, you have this rotation. And so the question is to describe the the rate of change when walking in direction V of what I'll call the one form frame. And so a frame is a tuple of three vectors, mutually orthogonal, mutually unit vectors, uh, right-handed rule, <laughs> uh, and, and, a, uh, and each one of those vectors, oh, so, sorry, we can talk about the frame tuple, which is this, F underline F1, F2, F3. Uh, and now we can take the sharp of each one of them, which we'll call sharp capital F, and that's called sigma. And it's sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, where oh, okay, I've got to be consistent, so I'm going to use superscripts and subscripts. Uh, it doesn't matter which one. I mean, it does matter in some quarters, but I'm not paying much attention to the, to the mathematical niceties of whether it's a superscript or a subscript. Um, and in any case, um, the idea is a sigma one is just sharp F1. So it's the parallel planes one apart, distance one apart in the F1 direction. And likewise for the F2 direction, uh, uh, for the F2 direction, uh, it's the series of planes orthogonal to that, and, and thus those planes are orthogonal to the F1, the F1 planes. The sigma one planes are orthogonal to the sigma two planes, and likewise sigma three orthogonal to the other two, uh, also one apart. Okay, so we talked about this frame tuple sigma, and Carton's major contribution uh, was that you should express the change of the frames in the local frame. Okay, so if I'm here and I get this frame, then I'm gonna talk about its rotation as something in that frame. And if I'm over here, that's a different frame, right? But I'm gonna talk about the, the rotations of that in that frame, okay? <laughs> so that's the, the, the critical thing that makes this thing pretty easy to understand. And so we, with that, we can re realize then that because of everything being linear, the rate of change for a walking direction of sigma has got coefficients in that sigma, <clears throat> right? That's just exactly staying in algebra what I just said. And the coefficients of, uh, to, to produce the, the component of this in F1 are omega 1, 1, omega 1, 2, and omega 1, 3 contracted on V for the walking directions. Okay, so they, these are one forms that when contracted on the walking direction, that's what this says, <laughs> give you scalars. And those scalars are the linear multiples of F1, F2, and F3, that is to say the components, uh, sorry, the linear, that linear multiple of F1, F2, and F3 that produce the coefficient in F1 of the rotation for that walking direction. Is that clear? And then this diagram that's up on the screen is really pretty important to understand. <laughs> so you talk, you talk about omega ij of V, but now V itself can be written in that frame, right? So if we talk about 
here we go, omega ij of v, that's going to be, since v is going to be v1 f1, it plus v2 f2 plus v3 f3, that is to say the components of v in the f1, f2, f3 coordinate system are v1, v2, v3, and since everything's linear, if you know what omega ij of f1 and omega ij of f2 and omega ij of f3 are, then you know everything. So all you have to know is what happens for the walking directions corresponding to the three frame elements. If I walk here and I walk walk here or walk here, then I'm then I, then I'm I'm in I'm in good shape, right? <laughs> and so. So the things that we end up wanting to know about are omega, omega ij of fk, okay? And what is that? Well, that says when you walk in the fk direction, it's the component of the swing of the ice frame element in the j element, right? So, I, so now I'm going to walk in this, and as a result of that, all of these guys are going to modify. And if and one of them, say the i, say the i is two here, the i one is going to have a component in in one, two, and three, and those components are those swing rates. Okay, <clears throat> follow? Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So we're going to now take this omega i j of Okay, I'm going to now say omega i j of f k and see what they are for some examples. Okay, namely for walking along a space curve or for walking on the tangent plane. That is to say, in the F1 or the F2 direction, because we can't walk in the F3 direction because F3 is the normal, for, and it, it'll take us off the plane, uh, off the surface, and that's not what we're in the business of doing. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, um, okay. So, before we do that application, I want to do one more piece of algebra. Uh, that uh, is um, going to yield some important insights. And that has to do, okay, so that has to do with taking, <coughs> thinking about what happens to the d sigmas. Well, that's <coughs> what I've written here. <coughs> Um, and what happens to the these one forms as you walk in some direction? So in other words, you now have these new one forms, omega ij for ij equals one all these value, all these entry values, and you are interested in what are their changes as you walk along as you walk along the surface. We'll see that that gives us some geometric understanding. Before we do that, though, we want to look at this, this, matrix, this, this matrix here, or more precisely, it when applied to any given walking direction. The point is that we've just said it's a rotation. It represents the difference between Strictly speaking, a derivative in the v direction is the difference between epsilon walking in the v direction and not and, and zero walking in the v direction, the original divided by epsilon, right? <laughs> so it's uh, it's that difference where you where you know that this guy is rotated. So it's a rotated version minus itself. Okay, and that fact that it's a rotation, from that, it turns out that it follows that, first of all, well, 
it follows that this is an anti-symmetric matrix. And so for it to be anti-symmetric, first of all, the diagonals have to be zero. Okay, so, the, so omega ii is zero. The component of i swinging into its set, the component in itself for any walking direction is zero. So when I say zero, strictly speaking, be careful. This is the zero one point. Okay. Secondly, um, the anti-symmetry gives you that gives me that those entries uh, are positive negative pairs. And I choose to write it this way because our convention is that three is the normal. <coughs> uh, or in the case, <coughs> uh, yeah, for, sorry, for a slab, for a, yeah, sorry, say that, for a surface, three is gonna be the normal. And we're gonna be interested in the normal swing the component of the normal swing in the in the first tangent space direction, and the normal swing of, into the second tangent space direction. The fact that the that the other guy swings into the normal with the negative of the same one is not all that. I mean, it's algebraically interesting, but that's not the one we're really interested in. <laughs> and so we're going to be interested in three that three one forms. These three, omega one two, omega three one, and omega one two. And as I said, omega three one is the component of the swing of the normal into the first direction. Omega three two is the component of the normal swing into the into the second direction. And the and omega one two is this guy, the swing of omega one two one in the two direction, right? <laughs> It's the rotation of the frame in, in the tangent plane. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so now we have this anti-symmetry. Uh, and then we, with that anti-symmetry, when you rewrite some of these equations, the fact that some of these guys are zero, comes in, and the fact that um, you can't leave the you can't leave the tangent plane uh, <coughs> comes in, and and so the first result that okay, so what it turns out the math, and it's not really important to understand that this, but anyway, if you take it turns out that if you take d of anything. Okay, so I'm going to put in anything. That's that anything can be a scalar, that anything can be a vector, that anything can be a, a one form, a two form, it doesn't matter what it is, right? <laughs> uh, D of D anything can be shown to be zero, always. Uh, uh, I'm not going to explain why that's so, other than to say you've seen it before by the fact that a partial derivative, a second partial derivative in xi, xj is the same as xj and xj and xi. It, it follows from that um, that sort of uh, behavior of of the linear things that that are calculus <laughs> uh, that are derivatives. But when you apply that, when you put when you put the anything as a sigma i, you get three equations, <laughs> and when you put the omega ij's into that, you get three equations, one for each of these important omega ij's, <laughs> okay? And those six equations are th six important equations due to Carton, okay? So there are these Carton connection equations, uh, and, uh, and they have some serious geometric significance. Um, two of them tell us how the principal curvatures change as as you walk a line, walk along a, a, the corresponding principal directions. So as you walk along 
the first principle direction. How does the principal curvature, how does, for example, kappa 2 change as you walk along kappa 1? Uh, sorry, P1 or F1. No, I'm sorry, P1 because we're walking in principal directions in that particular example. I'm not going to, so there's two of, two of the equations, six equations end up telling us something about that. And that's not important enough to make the uh, cut for, for what we're doing in this class, so I'm not going to talk about those. One of them produces this equation, <coughs> that omega 3, 2 of F1 is equal to omega 3, 1 of F2. But let's think about what that is. This is what we call the geodesic torsion, the twist, the swing of the normal into the second direction when you walk in the first direction. And F2 is just F1 perp, so this is the, how you swing into the, <laughs> into the one direction when you walk in the F1 perp direction. And here's the proof of what I uh, gave you last time, I mean many lectures ago I should say, that <clears throat> the uh, M2 matrix is symmetric. That is to say that the, these two twists are the same. <laughs> because that follows from this rotation argument. Um, the, uh, the three equations that you end up with as a result of all this study end up being that d sigma 1 equals omega 1 2 wedge sigma 2. What's wedge? Well, wedge product is uh, the geometric, the well-stated version of what you always called cross product. Uh, cross product, if you, uh, if you are curious, you had the same, love, same concern as I did. I always wondered, what the heck is this stupid thing? You take the, the vector and you do some determinant thing and it's an opposite, it's orthogonal to the other two directions. Uh, wow, what's happening here, right? And the answer is something that we haven't had time to spend on, but the idea is that you can take two vectors <laughs> and create an aerial element out of it. So just as a vector is a, a line element, <laughs> you can talk about an aerial element with sense. What sense? Well, you can think of it as the sense being either it's oriented like that or it's oriented the other way, or you can think of it <laughs> as what you, if you use a right-handed rule, it corresponds to that way or that way. <laughs> and so you have this idea of an aerial element with sense. So it is, it's signed just like, with, it has a sense just like a vector has a sense. <laughs> and the wedge product is exactly this, this aerial element. It's called a two-form uh, <clears throat> that comes from combining two vectors into, into that. And, and then you do the same thing for the sharps, and you get a sharp of the, uh, you take the sharp of this vector and the sharp of this vector, and you get the sharp of the whole aerial element. And by the way, there's a three form, <laughs> okay? And there's some interesting things about those that I'm not going to get, that I'm not going to get into. But the main point is you need to now understand this guy <laughs> as a, a two form, something that contracts on a, Two vector, <coughs> a two vector is what I talked about here. This is actually a two vector, but the two form is uh, is is a uh, a cross hatch of cylinders. <laughs> if you take the the one form that corresponds to this guy and the one form that corresponds to this guy, you end up with all these planes and planes and they form parallelograms 
forming a bunch of cylinders, uh, parallelogram shaped cylinders. For those of you who are uncomfortable with the word cylinder, you should realize that for a mathematician, the thing that you call a cylinder is a right circular cylinder. A cylinder is any extruded object along a line. <laughs> okay, and so we're talking about a cylinder where you're extruding a parallelogram <laughs> uh, along along a line, and you get this continued in this direction and in this direction set of those. And at one point, I don't know if I still have it in here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's another folder, but oh, I got it here. There is one. Okay, so so that's a that's a two form. That's a sorry. That is a yeah. That's a two form, and that gets contracted on a two vector to measure areas. <coughs> uh, okay, enough background mathematics. Get back to this. It said we have a formula that. Uh, taking into account the symmetries and the fact that the components in the third dimension go away and the fact that you get zeros, uh, you get, um, you end up with these formulas that d sigma one is omega one, two, wedge sigma two. D, omega, d sigma two is omega two, one, wedge sigma one. And for every ij, in particular these three that we care about, <laughs> The omega ij is omega ik wedge omega kj, where k is the, the one. Okay, so omega ii. I mean, if, if i is equal to j, then this is d of zero. That gives you zero. I don't care about that. So if i not equal to j in three space, k is the other, the other index that i and j aren't. <laughs> okay, it's the other index besides i and j. So in particular, the omega one two is omega one two wedge omega two three. Um, no, sorry, I said that wrong. Omega one two is omega one three wedge omega three two because k is the thing that's neither one nor two. I'm a little lost here. So what I regard is uh, omega i j should be a square instead of left. Why? Say, speak louder. I can't hear you. Uh, what, what I, I'm thinking is like the omega ij seems to me it's a scalar. No, omega ij is a is a is a one form. It's a, omega ij contracted on v for a walking direction is a scalar, but omega ij is a form that that takes a vector, namely the walking direction, to give you a scalar. <clears throat> so omega, and on the screen, omega two three of f two is indeed a scalar. But omega two three is a one form waiting for waiting for a walking direction to be filled in. So this omega thing, whoop, just put a tilde on this and not a sorry. <clears throat> is it omega is a matrix a three by three matrix of one forms. And when contracted on a walking direction, it's a set of coefficients of F1, F2, and F3 telling you swings for that V. That, so how to interpret so the judge, geometric meaning of WIJ as a vector? Okay, it's not W, let's be sure to call it omega. omega. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it looks like a W, but... Uh, and, and even the Microsoft Word has gone so far as to, to when you type a W and then say put it in a symbol form, it comes out it comes out omega, but it's not a W, it's an omega. <laughs> it's a vowel pronounced O, and it's not a consonant pronounced one. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, um, the uh, get back to the, the the question here. The best I can do for you is that it's a machine, a linear machine, that you put in a walking direction and it gives you these, uh, it, it gives you this swing rate, <laughs> okay? And because of the linearity of everything, uh, you can understand its components in these respective directions 
And in fact, that's what they are. So omega, if you look at omega-2-3 of F1, that's the component of omega-2-3 in the F1 direction. In fact, that's true of any form, one form, right? If you have a one form and you write it in terms of sigma-1, sigma-2, and sigma-3, it's the basis for those one forms, then the coefficients can be shown to be omega-2-3 of F1, omega-2-3 of F2, and omega-2-3 of F3. That is to say, it is a one form that has omega-2-3 of F1 as its first component, <laughs> That's its multiple of sigma one, omega two three of F two as its multiple of F two, and as omega two three. I'm sorry. Let me say omega two three of F one, omega two three of F two, and omega two three of F three as its component in F three. So, so like any working direction, you can uh, write in a linear combination of F one. And F3, yeah. and because this whole thing is linear, actually, like uh, you can uh, decompose it like uh, into omega two three F1, and uh, by time the projection of, of the working direction you want is in F1. That's right. F1. That's right. Yeah, it's exactly. This whole thing is turns out into some very some I'll say linear algebra that we don't have time to practice here. <laughs> Okay, so you have these three, these two well, these two equations, and these three, because you have one of those for for three one, three two, and one two, <clears throat> and those equations that give give you two of them give you this um, uh, two of them give give you this uh, this how the Principal curvatures behave as you walk along, but the other, the other of the others, there's one in particular that is really very important for us to talk about, and that's the one where i and j are one two. And for that one, The result that turns out to be that. Okay, you end up <coughs> with a determinant of all these omega ijs of whatever that turns out to be exactly the determinant that we defined capital K as being. <coughs> and you get that the omega 1, 2 equals minus the Gaussian curvature times sigma 1 wedge sigma 2. <coughs> Another way of the way to understand that this is a basis aerial element. This says d omega one two is minus k dA. Okay, <coughs> and I'm going to write that up here for later use because we're going to come back to it in a minute. <coughs> okay, <coughs> what that says is. If I walk around a circuit, for example, on a surface, <coughs> then, and I integrate k inside the circuit, that I'm going to get evidence about the curvature of the circuit by the way the omega one two swings as you walk as you go around the circuit. <coughs> how is how is this happening as I walk around the surface? circuit is going to give me evidence about the curvature in the middle. And we'll see that shortly. But I want to get off this tent. So, so what we've said was we got some, some useful geometric information from these Carton equations, and we're going to stop looking at them right now. And instead, we're going to come back to this this guy and make it uh, much more concrete by applying it to uh, the walking along the curve for a space curve and the walking along a, a walking direction on a surface first for the surface.
So, for a space curve, we said there's only one walking direction of it that's possible, and it is the tangent. That's the fitted frame. The one thing for sure is that the tangent has to be the walking direction. Right? You can only walk on the tangent to a curve. Can't, otherwise, you get off the curve. So, okay. So we're going to have F1 equals T. <coughs> That's the, the... And we're only going to be interested in <coughs> D F1 of, it, of any of the frame elements. Because those are the only walking directions that we can <coughs> we can deal with. Okay. <clears throat> well. <clears throat> okay. So let's look at this omega thing. <clears throat> so this says that <clears throat> what happens. For example, to the tangent <laughs> when I walk in the F1 direction. Right? <clears throat> so That's what this row tells us, what happens to sigma 1. <laughs> this row tells us what happens to sigma 2. This row tells us what happens to sigma 3. Now, if we're walking in the tension direction, this uh, <coughs> tangent vector here is going to swing in some plane. And we're going to, by definition, choose F2 to be the vector orthogonal to F1 in that plane. OK? <clears throat> Put another way, the sigma d F1 of sigma 1 is <clears throat> some constant, I'm going to call it kappa, times sigma 2, uh, <coughs> well, no, sorry, it's, first of all, it's going to be 0, that's this, times sigma 1, <coughs> plus kappa times sigma 2. And by definition, since it's, it only goes in that plane, it has no component in sigma 3. So 0 times sigma 3. OK, so now sigma 1 is the one form, or the sharp of it is the, fr is the frame element orthogonal to the tangent direction. <laughs> and that guy gets called the normal. The standard term for, <clears throat> in space curve theory, the normal is the thing norm normal to the tangent direction, but in the, in the uh, swinging direction, so I have one question. Why is the space is zero on the uh, omega three? Because intuitively, like when we work on the uh, tangent direction, so like the change of the tangent direction will also have a component. That comes out later. But so far, I've I have simply said that I am defining that F one swings. The <clears throat> the first order behavior of F one is on is in the tangent plane. It's got to be a rotation. And rotations are rotations of two vectors are in planes. Sorry, you're right. It's the second order process that makes the the F1 come out of the plane. But we're talking about only the behavior. <coughs> uh, and, and by definition, we're saying there is a plane that it rotates in to first order, and that's what d sigma does. What you're telling me is that yeah, the it it all the it all the rotation of this guy is going to. <coughs> Also do something in the in the other thing in the other direction, but that's the second order pro, uh, fact, effect. <laughs> okay, so so the upshot is 
that. All right, let's get rid of all this. So for this example, so far we've got, okay, so this is the example of a space curve in 3D. <coughs> so far, what we've got is that this thing is zero, 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 and I've put in kappa zero there. <laughs> and kappa is called the curvature of the space curve. Okay? <coughs> now, uh, let me get my nose tickets, make sure I get my, uh, get the story straight. Um, sorry for this, should have been better prepared. Um, yes. But you also know by the anti-symmetry that minus kappa has to go there. <laughs> so <clears throat> this last guy, F3, is going to be F1 <laughs> across F2. OK, it's the third element of the frame, <clears throat> cross primes of the other two. And it gets the name B, the binomial. And so now we have that our F matrix, our F array, excuse me, is T N B. Just another way of saying F1, F2, F3. <coughs> so you say <coughs> this guy is the binomial. Right, so this is F1, the tangent to the curve. Here is the swing of that curve to first order. And here is the behavior of that plane as you walk in that direction. And that has to do with the swing of the binomial. Okay, so now you say there's a swing of the binomial. <clears throat> uh, and It turns out then that you can show that this is what happens. <laughs> oh, sorry, this guy has to be zero by the anti-symmetry. <clears throat> and so there's only one place to put in here a tau or a tau. And the tau is called the uh the what am I blocking on the on the turn? Uh Anyway, okay, I'll, I'll come up with, I'll, I'll undo the block in a moment. But it's the, it is the curvature, it's the degree to which the curve comes out of the best fitting plane. Okay? <laughs> and so it's really only two parameters. Two, this is not really off not omega, but omega on F1. That is to say on T, because that's the only walking direction you're allowed. And there are, here is this matrix. And it simply says there are two parameters. And one of them is the swing of the, uh, the, the uh, tangent into the normal. And the other is the, is the swing of the binomial into the uh, <laughs> into the uh, other tangent plane. And this says, moreover, it only swings into F2. Right? There's no swing into F1 because of this anti-symmetry constraint. So the binomial only swings in the direction of walking. <coughs> That's how it comes out of the plane. And the single curvature parameter, which is the rate of change, rate at which that happens. 
Now you might ask me, you'll have to ask me, wait a second. You have a, I, I said that df1 of sigma one is kappa of sigma two, but wait a second, there's a sign issue. Is what, what do you mean by <coughs> the a negative or a positive value of this of this term, right? <coughs> and uh, <coughs> and the answer is um, we. A can show that it's generically not zero, and B, if we can, by convention, choose the sigma two direction to be the direction for which cap is positive. So, right, <clears throat> and so the choice of whether this is the binomial or that's the, I'm sorry, this is the normal or that's the normal, right? This is the normal or that's the normal is made by convention such that kappa will, the curvature will always be positive. So we can say kappa is greater than zero, whereas this tau can, can have a sign. Like it can, once you've done that, it can go that way or go that way, depending on, right, in, in terms, sorry, it goes into F2. <laughs> this is F1, that's F2. So it's this here. And that can have a sign negative or positive, <laughs> depending on what the kappa is necessarily positive. Okay, so now you've uh, uh, know everything, pretty much everything you need to know about what's called the Darbu theory, the Darbu frame. Uh, the uh, anyway, the uh, the frame associated with uh, with walking on a on a space curve. Moreover, you can spend some time <clears throat> on thinking about what the hinge is of these rotations, because every, rota every one of these rotations is about a hinge. Well, we know what it is for the, for the uh, binomial, it hinges F1. <laughs> uh, we know what it, and we can ask that, what the hinge is of the whole frame and I'll not spend time on that, but the equations that we have are enough to tell you all that. So that you, the whole frame is rotating about some axis. What's the hinge? What's the rotational axis? And what's the rate about that axis? Okay, so um, enough, on, enough on walking on a space curve. Now let's come back to this equation when we're walking on a, uh, walking on a uh, surface. All right. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> first of all, we never walk in the F3 direction. So we're interested in omega one, two of F1, omega 1, 2 of F2, omega 3, 1 of F1, omega 3, 2 of F2, and omega 3, uh, sorry, omega 3, 1 of F2, and omega 3, 2 of F1, and omega 3, 2 of F2. Right? <clears throat> Those are the six values that will allow us to build up <clears throat> what the components of these guys are in the potential walking directions F1 and F2. Well, and all linear and all linear combinations of them. This guy we've given a name to. What's that? Swing of the normal into the first into the direction of walking when you walk. It's it well. It's just it is normal curvature. We call that k1. It is it is indeed the principal curvature if f1 is a principal direction. But it's, we call it k1. <laughs> it's the 
it's the normal curvature when walking in the first, well, it's normal curvature for walking in the first direction. This guy here, similarly, is K2. It's the normal curvature <coughs> when walking in the F2 direction. <coughs> These two are the geodesic torsions. <coughs> They're both tau. <coughs> right? <coughs> okay, so the upshot is that these four that, are, that appear, if you will, here and here and in their negatives in the corresponding positions here and here, give us the normal curvatures and the geodesic torsion. <clears throat> By the way, I stopped blocking on that space curve thing. The tau is called torsion, just torsion. Okay, so you have curvature and torsion for space curves. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now let's look at omega one, two. Let me write this down. Uh, okay. Um, just notice the identity here. This has to be this way. If you contract omega 1, 2 on F1, you get sigma 1 contracted on F1, which is 1, and you get sigma 2 contracted on F1, which is 0. Right. You measure something in these planes along one of the planes, it may, it doesn't cross any planes. <laughs> and so this is omega 1, 2 of F1 is omega 1, 2 of F1. And likewise, if you contract this on F2, you get omega 1, 2 of F2. It has, the algebra has to work out that way, and that's how you, how you get that. But fine. And let's now, uh, for... Uh, to help our understanding, now let's restrict ourselves to F1 and F2 being principal. So now I want to do that. Okay, so now I'm going to let F1 be P1 and F2 be P2. So now what you said is so. This thing becomes F1. <coughs> This thing becomes kappa 2, and both of these, the tau's, become 0. Because that's the definition of a principal direction. You don't have any geodesic torsion. Okay? <clears throat> and so, so now you have the very simple situation that in principle, in principal coordinates, the in principal coordinates, the omega matrix is simply uh, kappa one. Sigma one down there, <coughs> and minus kappa one sigma one up here. <coughs> uh, the omega three two is kappa two sigma two. <coughs> Has only a component in. Uh, and you get the same thing here, minus kappa 2, sigma 2. These are zeros. And what's left is this thing. And it's negative. I guess it's this thing, this thing over here, and it's negative over there. 
<laughs> omega one, two of F one, sigma one plus omega F two of sigma times sigma two. So now we have this cartoon matrix, this matrix of one forms that apply in principal coordinates. Fine. When we <coughs> look at this, the omega one, two thing, okay, so I've, I'm, I'm done with what this rotation descriptor is of a frame. First in any frame, any fitted frame where the normal is F3. And secondly, for the particular case when you're in principal, in principal coordinates. <coughs> I now want to come back to this guy here. It's important for two for two ways, or three ways. I'm going to, in the next four or five minutes, tell you what those are, and then I'm going to have to run off to my next obligation. Um, the first is that it is really important in understand. It brings in something that is used very frequently in moving a frame from one place to another along a surface, and even in high dimensional surfaces like you have in feature space, when you wanna carry a frame along the surface, you need to transport it. And the particular form of transport that is normally understood is called parallel transport. And it will be important for us to understand what parallel transport is, because we're gonna be parallel transporting our our frame around a little circle, a little cycle in on a surface in 3D, but you're going to need to do that. You want to do shape statistics, you want to know shape change. <coughs> you have a deformation. Deformations live in a high on a high dimensional, very high dimensional surface. You want to do statistics on the deformation, and one deformation takes you, it starts here and starts at this place and another one starts at this place, you have to transport the two of them together so that you can make sense of uh, sense of a, a common deformation that can be compared. You can say what the mean deformation is, for example. And so um, okay, so parallel transport is going to be important to us. The next thing that's important is this particular relationship which gives us a means of computing curvatures. And it's used in computer science as the most common means to compute curvatures if you have a tiled surface or you have a surface discreetly described. Okay, there's a different way you do if you have it analytically described, the <coughs> surface. But if you have it discreetly described, we're gonna be using that. And the third reason it's important is related to the second. And this has to do with a theorem that is really pretty surprising. It's called the Gauss Bonnet theorem. And it has to do with the integral of this thing, the integral of KDA over the whole surface. Okay, so now I have this principal curvature. No, that's right. Gaussian curvature, and I have it at every point on the surface, and now I'm going to integrate that KDA over the whole surface. And the surprising result is that that is 2 pi times an index, an integer index, that's, that is called the Euler characteristic. <laughs> and the Euler characteristic can be shown to be twice, is defined as twice two minus twice the number of holes in the object. 
And this number of holes is called the genus of the object. So for an object like this, it has no holes. I know through holes. <laughs> so the genus is zero, so the Euler characteristic. For a torus, there's one hole through the torus, right? You have a torus, you have a hole through it. So the genus is one, the Euler characteristic is zero, the Euler characteristic is zero. Okay? And there's a surprising theorem with a Gauss Bonnet theorem that when you integrate the Gaussian curvature of any surface whatsoever, <coughs> closed surface, if it has boundary, there's a different form of the theorem, but I'm not going to talk about that form. You get two pi times a two pi times an integer, and that integer is so you take you take a surface, a sphere, a small sphere, a big sphere, this thing, a pair, anything that's of of genus zero, you're going to get four pi for this integer. Doesn't matter. We forget that theorem at our peril as a computer scientist. When you are estimating curvatures, you better make sure that whatever you do, you follow that theorem. And that's where we're going to stop today. <coughs> so, so in the next uh, lecture, we'll talk about uh, how to uh, compute this uh, Gaussian curvature. We'll shape. talk about how to compute Gaussian curvature. We'll talk about how to compute the principal curvatures <clears throat> talk about how to compute the principal directions. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, shape types. Uh, <clears throat> it turns out that all this, when it's, put, when it's all put together, gives you a very small category, a very small catalog of shape types. Uh, I'm starting to think it's going to be two more lectures rather than one, by the way. But yes, we will talk about that. Sorry to have to run off.